I love food. I love food. Hello, lovely people. I'm Aaron Arnold. Welcome to the Eat Is Love TV's Food Nerd Playlist. Let's dig in. In this, my first video. Well, it's almost hard to know where to start because food is more of a cycle without a beginning or ending point. It's the thing that connects all us living things to all the other living things. It's not just a crucial part of the web of life, it is the web of life. In fact, food is life. It makes us kin to the entire 3.8 billion year old family of living things. We're all connected and food is the how and the why. And while there are likely endless topics, there really is just one conversation. And because of that, I'm not here to tell you how to eat or what to eat. There are already more than enough people trying to convince you and sell you on their way of living and eating. And some of them are really smart. I personally read a lot of their books, so more power to them. It's just that that's not the purpose of this channel. So I'm not interested in promoting this diet or that lifestyle or brands, buzzwords, bandwagons, fads, or self-images. There's no promises here and no static. This is just a conversation, and I'm going to be learning along with you. It's not that I don't have opinions about food. Oh, oh, I do. And you'll be hearing a lot of them. But I'm here to learn and have fun. And persuading you feels like a chore. It just doesn't seem like fun. Okay, but where to start? Well... The beginning, I suppose, because the story of what you eat starts long before you take your first bite. It begins before you cook, before you buy your food at the store, before it's shipped to the store, before you see that inspiring recipe on YouTube, yay YouTube. And the story of your food starts even before the first crop's seed is planted, and the impact of your food extends and ripples far beyond your last bite. So let's step into our little history machine and set the controls for the beginning of food, which is actually quite literally the beginning of the universe and the beginning of time itself. I'll try to keep this simple so that we can get on with the more fun food stuff. But the beginning of the food story really is the beginning of the whole universe. And knowing that puts your whole food story in context. So bear with me a little. You see, as soon as the first stars started glowing and doing their star stuff, one of the things they started doing was making all of the elements. The elements make up the whole rest of the universe because that's what stars do. They burn up hydrogen and turn it into stuff. And good thing, too, because back then there was nothing else in the universe except for hydrogen. Pretty boring little universe. But then the stars started burning it up and turning it into things like helium, oxygen, silicon, iron, potassium, and wait for it, everybody's favorite element and the talk of the town, carbon. Carbon is the basis of all life on this planet. You probably hear about it all the time. We have too much carbon in the atmosphere. We're carbon-based life forms. We need to address the carbon issue. This gizmo is carbon-free or carbon-neutral and carbon this and carbon that and carbon, 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 carbon. I mean, it's enough to make you want <laughs> a carbonated beverage. So what's so special about carbon anyway? Well, the cool thing about carbon is that it's like the universe's favorite Lego piece. It attaches to other things really easily and it's also pretty good at letting them go so it can be rearranged to become the building block of everything you need to make life. Its ability to easily attach and detach makes it really good at building things like proteins, carbohydrates, fat, DNA, bones, muscles, grass, flowers, hair, spit, poop, and so pretty much not just our entire bodies, but also all the things our bodies eat and use as fuel. In fact, most of the energy we use to heat our homes, drive our cars, power our laptops and phones and tablets and electric toothbrushes comes from carbon that's been stored under the ground for millions and millions of years. So whether you're a tree or an ant or an accountant or a chef, carbon is basically the currency we all use to exchange energy. It is the basis of all life. You could almost say that the entire process of life is just moving carbon from one place to another. We would do well to stop thinking of carbon as something bad that we need to get rid of. Carbon is food. Carbon is us. 
a carbon-free future would be a future with no living things. Now, we need to change our relationship with carbon. In fact, it's vital that we do, and as soon as possible. But carbon is not the bad guy. Carbon is life. And for billions of years, carbon has been moved around our planet by living things and all the other forces of physics and nature. Plants eat the carbon out of the air and use it to build their leaves, stems, roots, and flowers, very literally, out of thin air. And as part of that process, they sort of exhale oxygen. We animals breathe in that oxygen, and then we exhale carbon, which the plants then absorb to build themselves, and then the whole process starts over again. It's really elegant. And it's been working pretty well for a long, 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 long time. And the most interesting thing about this is the way carbon moves in a cycle. So does water. So does nitrogen. So do matter and energy, life, the universe, and everything. See, I told you food was about everything. And these cycles have been working for an extraordinarily long time. So imagine this whole process of animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, all eating each other, giving and taking the same relatively small collection of carbon atoms with the general cooperation of the laws of physics and chemistry and the natural forces on our cute little planet. And despite a few you know, little catastrophic events that nearly wipe out all life on the planet, I mean, just little hiccups, really. This goes on mostly uninterrupted for, as I said, an extraordinarily long time. In fact, let's just pretend this veritable orgy of things eating one another in a life-death symphony that defies all imagination for about 3.8 billion years, until finally we meet a curious animal that belongs to a family of ape-like creatures that aren't particularly strong or fast or powerful. They don't have sharp claws or fangs or poisonous bites. In a lot of ways, they're marvelously unremarkable and unimpressive, but they have extremely strong social bonds, and they're willing to eat just about anything. So meet the utterly unimpressive Homo habilis, your great 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 grandparents and mine. Not particularly smart by modern human standards, and not particularly gifted compared to much of the animal kingdom, but somewhere between one and two million years ago, they do something amazing. They make this. And yes, this is real. This is an actual 1.5 million year old knife made by an actual 1.5 million year ago Homo habilis, and it changed everything. For starters, it allowed them to scrape more food off of the bones they found. So carcasses that had already been picked over by other animals still had plenty of calories on them that only Homo habilis could get to thanks to knife. And maybe more importantly, they used it to open up the bones and get to that incredibly nutritious marrow. Marrow is really high in fat. So much so that I call this the first food revolution because that fat allowed Homo habilis to grow bigger brains. And it happened so fast that paleontologists actually call this the brain boom. Because within just a half a million short years later, they've already evolved into a whole new species we call Homo erectus. A Homo erectus took it to the next level because they learned how to control fire. And here's where things get really interesting the second food revolution, and maybe the most important moment in the entire human story. Because imagine what happens next. They start prepping their food, chopping, cutting, portioning, and talking while they do, however primitively. And then they start cooking their food, talking while they do. And then they sit down and eat a meal together, talking while they do. Maybe they talked about the places they harvested these plants and animals. Maybe they remember what those places looked like last season or last year or years and years ago when your mother's mother was still alive. And maybe your father's father was the greatest hunter, or if he wasn't, you embellish the story a little bit. But you see, those embellishments and stories might morph and develop and start to contain little life lessons. And as we're finishing our meal and the fire dies down and the stars start to become visible, maybe some of that uh, fermented fruit we gathered starts to show up and kind of lubricate our story's credibility. And even we get to the point where the stars themselves become the characters in our stories. And at some point, the telling of stories becomes just as much the focus of our meal as the food itself. It becomes our way of passing wisdom among one another and through generations. 
Our cultures become more cohesive. Our sense of belonging and family and tribe become central to our perspective. And don't you see all within a veritable blink of an eye in star time, Homo erectus, whose ancestors had only recently begun walking upright, and whose forebears not even just a million short years earlier invented knives, invented fire building, cooking, storytelling, and with it intergenerational identity and wisdom and tradition. That's a lot for one mediocre ape-like ancestor. <laughs> but let's focus for now on the invention of storytelling. What does it take to be a good storyteller? Well, for starters, wisdom and knowledge. You need to have facts and events to talk about. You also need imagination, and that is the ability to think in the abstract. In other words, you need to have the ability to make sh** up. In a way, it could be said that all art is made up because any work of art, any story, any graven image is just a representation of an idea. The story isn't an actual event any more than a picture of a horse is an actual horse. Art is an abstraction. It's something made from an idea. And the same part of our brain, by the way, that allows us to make up a story and make up art is the same part of our brain that allows us to lie. But I digress. A storyteller needs wisdom and imagination. And what do wisdom and imagination need? A good brain. And what does a good brain need? Well, not a finger poking at it. But anyway, a good brain is made mostly of fat. So you need lots of fat to build a big brain. And a brain runs mostly on carbohydrates. So, just like a car needs steel to build and gas to run, a brain needs fat to build and carbohydrates to run. So suddenly, diet has a whole new role in our evolution. And assuming that a strong storytelling tradition made a clan generally more cohesive, cooperative, imaginative, organized, and wiser, it had to have made a clan more successful in general. Clans that were able to eat a lot of fat grew bigger brains. And if they had a good supply of carbohydrates, they were able to run those brains at full throttle. And if they had access to, you know, fermented fruit, well, that probably added a certain richness to the stories and the listeners, because after all, the drunker you get, the more interesting my stories are. So for the next million years or so, Homo erectus keeps eating more fat, telling more stories, and having more babies who incrementally have bigger brains and become better adapted at walking upright and by about... 200-ish uh, thousand years ago, they have evolved in what we would recognize as us, Homo sapiens, the omnivorous, fat-craving, sugar-craving, clan-loving, big-butted, fib-telling knife-maker who loves nothing more than a good story, and it couldn't have, wouldn't have never happened except that we learned to cook and eat a nice meal together. We made the food, and then the food made us, and that's still true today. You make the food, and then the food makes you. You make the food, and then the food makes you. We still didn't have sharp claws or fangs. We couldn't run very fast, although we could run really far thanks to our ginormous butts. We didn't shoot poison out of our teeth, but our strong social bonds and imaginations gave us something that perhaps none of the other animals had, intergenerational wisdom. We could pass information down the generations and keep traditions that allowed us to know what had already been learned by our great-great-great-grand people. And we also ate just about everything. And the invention of knives and cooking gave us access to even more foods. And that story, the story of knives, is really interesting. So interesting, in fact, that it's going to get its whole own video or three, where we're just going to kind of play with knives. But for now, we're going to wrap up this video. Thanks for watching. And of course, it would be remiss of me to not remind you that if you found this video of value, if you'd like to see more content like this made, and you'd like to support the channel, then please do like, subscribe, hit the notification button, and comment, if nothing else, just to tell me how full of it I am. And as a reward for watching my video, the first person to type carbon is life in the comments will get this mug. Well, not this exact mug, but one very much like it. And I can see that it's getting a little washed out. I'm looking at my monitor now. But it's got an awesome Eat is Love logo, just like, just like my awesome little apron over there. It's the Eat is Love logo on this cup. And it's not washed out. It's a really high quality 
mugs. So what's that apron? Well, that apron is a high quality apron. And I'll probably end up giving some of those away too. But yeah, this is a great mug. You can drink out of it. It doesn't leak. It's, it's a good piece of kitchenware. And it has this awesome Eat Is Love logo. It says, Eat Is Love. Ain't that just the truth? Anyway, type in Carbon Is Life in the comments field. And the first person to do that will get a mug very much like this one. Thanks again for watching. I hope to see you next time. Ciao.